Today we're going to finish the last bit of chapter 16 and start chapter 17 of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. So where we left off last, Harry, Hermione, and Ron had gone into the chamber to try and get to the Sorcerer's Stone. So first they dealt with Fluffy, the three-headed dog, and Harry played the flute that Hagrid had made him for Christmas. And they were able to get Fluffy to sleep and get past him. Then they had to jump down this trap door where they landed on some plants and they're like, oh good, we landed on something soft. And then Hermione pointed out that Harry and Ron were getting wrapped up by this plant and stuck, like it was tight. But Hermione had realized in time to get away from the plant and she was able to use her magic to uh, make a fire that made the plant release Harry and Ron. So they keep going. In the next room, they had keys flying all around. At first they thought they were birds and they realized they were like actual keys that had wings on them. And they had to find the right one and capture it to open the next door. And Harry, who, you know, is the seeker for the Quidditch team, was able to, first of all, spot that one of the keys had a bit of a bent wing, showing it had already been caught once, and to catch it to open the door. So then in the next room, they, I'm trying to remember the order. There was the chest and then there was the troll. I think the next room might have been the troll where they saw an even bigger troll than the one that they had seen before on Halloween and fought, but it had already been knocked out by whoever had gone through first. Then they get to a room that has a giant chest set. And you know, with wizard's chest, the pieces are like alive. And in this case, Ron realizes that they need to choose pieces to take the place of and play. So each of them chooses a piece to play as, and then Ron, who's really good at chess, directs everyone for what they have to do. And at the end, Ron realizes that the only way for them to win is for him to like sacrifice himself. So he has to let himself be taken. And in this intense game of wizard's chess, when a piece gets taken, they like smash them on the head, uh, whether it's a stone piece or person so he makes a sacrifice and he gets knocked out but they do win the game so now Harry and Hermione are able to keep going and they get to a room with potions on it, and they realize this is Snape's room uh, the one that he had planned to protect the stone so there's like seven potions on a table and then there's like a riddle with clues that they use to have to figure out which potion will let them get through to the next door. There's like a fire uh, that's at the door to the next room. And then there's also another fire at the door that leads them back to the room they were just in. So Hermione figures out the riddle, uh, but they see that the potion to get through the next door is only enough for one person. So Harry's going to drink that potion, and then Hermione's going to drink another potion to get her back through the door they came in from so she can go and send a note to Dumbledore telling him that they need his help. So that's where we left off and we're about to find out what happens when Harry goes through this final door. Here I come, he said, and he drained the little bottle in one gulp. It was indeed as though ice was flooding his body. He put the bottle down and walked forward. He braced himself, saw the black flames licking his body, but couldn't feel them. For a moment, he could see nothing but dark fire. Then he was on the other side in the last chamber. There was already someone there, but it wasn't Snape. It wasn't even Voldemort. All right, before we go to the next chapter, I want you to stop for a second and think, who do you think might be in that last chamber? What is your prediction? All right, let's find out if you were right. Chapter 17, The Man with Two Faces. It was Quirrell. What? Did you expect that? You, gasped Harry. Quirrell smiled. His face wasn't twitching at all. Me, he said calmly. I wondered whether I'd be meeting you here, Potter. But I thought, Snape. Severus? Quirrell laughed. And it wasn't his usual quivering treble either. Cold and sharp. Yes, Severus does seem the type, doesn't he? So useful to have him swooping around like an overgrown bat. Next to him, who would suspect p -p poor, stuttering st st Professor Quirrell? Harry couldn't take it in. This couldn't be true. It couldn't. But Snape tried to kill me. No, no, no. I tried to kill you. 
Your friend, Miss Granger, accidentally knocked me over as she rushed to set fire to Snape at the Quidditch match. She broke my eye contact with you. Another few seconds, and I'd have gotten you off that broom. I'd have managed it before then if Snape had been muttering a counter curse trying to save you. Snape was trying to save me? Of course, said Quirrell coolly. Why do you think he wanted to referee your next match? He was trying to make sure I didn't do it again. Funny, really. He needn't have bothered. I couldn't do anything with Dumbledore watching. All the other teachers thought Snape was trying to stop Gryffindor from winning. He did make himself unpopular. And what a waste of time, when after all that, I'm going to kill you tonight. Quirrell snapped his fingers. Ropes sprang out of thin air and wrapped themselves tightly around Harry. You're too nosy to live, Potter, scurrying around the school on Halloween like that. For all I knew, you'd seen me coming to look at what was guarding the stone. You let the troll in? Certainly. I have a special gift with trolls. You must have seen what I did to the one in the chamber back there. Unfortunately, while everyone else was running around looking for it, Snape, who already suspected me, went straight to the third floor to head me off. And not only did my troll fail to beat you to death, that three-headed dog didn't even manage to bite Snape's leg off properly. Now, wait quietly, Potter. I need to examine this interesting mirror. It was only then that Harry realized what was standing behind Quirrell. It was the mirror of Erised. This mirror is the key to finding the stone, Quirrell murmured, tapping his way around the frame. Trust Dumbledore to come up with something like this, but he's in London. I'll be far away by the time he gets back. All Harry could think of doing was to keep Quirrell talking and stop him from concentrating on the mirror. I saw you and Snape in the forest, he blurted out. Yes, said Quirrell idly, walking around the mirror to look at the back. He was on to me by that time, trying to find out how far I got. He suspected me all along, tried to frighten me, as though he could, when I had Lord Voldemort on my side. Quirrell came back out from behind the mirror and stared hungrily into it. I see the stone. I'm presenting it to my master. But where is it? Harry struggled against the ropes binding him, but they didn't give. He had to keep Quirrell from giving his whole attention to the mirror. But Snape always seemed to hate me so much. Oh, he does, said Quirrell casually. Heavens, yes. He was at Hogwarts with your father. Didn't you know? They loathed each other. But he never wanted you dead. But I heard you a few days ago, sobbing. I thought Snape was threatening you. For the first time, a spasm of fear flitted across Quirrell's face. Sometimes, he said, I find it hard to follow my master's instructions. He is a great wizard, and I am weak. You mean he was there in the classroom with you? Harry gasped. He is with me wherever I go, said Quirrell quietly. I met him when I traveled around the world. A foolish young man I was then, full of ridiculous ideas about good and evil. Lord Voldemort showed me how wrong I was. There is no good and evil. There is only power, and those too weak to see it. Since then, I have served him faithfully, although I have let him down many times. He has had to be very hard on me. Quirrell shivered suddenly. He does not forgive mistakes easily. When I failed to steal the stone from Gringotts, he was most displeased. He punished me, decided he would have to keep a closer watch on me. Quirrell's voice trailed away. Harry was remembering his trip to Diagon Alley. How could he have been so stupid? He'd seen Quirrell there that very day, shaking hands with him in the leaky cauldron. Quirrell cursed under his breath. I don't understand. Is the stone inside the mirror? Should I break it? Harry's mind was racing. What I want more than anything else in the world at the moment, he thought, is to find the stone before Quirrell does. So if I look in the mirror, I should see myself finding it, which means I'll see where it's hidden. But how can I look without Quirrell realizing what I'm up to? He tried to edge to the left to get in front of the glass without Quirrell noticing, but the ropes around his ankles were too tight. He tripped and fell over. Quirrell ignored him. He was still talking to himself. What does this mirror do? How does it work? Help me, master. And to Harry's horror, a voice answered, and the voice seemed to come from Quirrell himself. Use the boy. Use the boy. Quirrell rounded on Harry. Yes, Potter, come here. He clapped his hands once, and the ropes binding Harry fell off. Harry got slowly to his feet. Come here, Quirrell repeated. Look in the mirror and tell me what you see. Harry walked toward him. I must lie, he thought desperately. I must look and lie about what I see. That's all. 
Coral moved close behind him. Harry breathed in the funny smell that seemed to come from Coral's turban. He closed his eyes, stepped in front of the mirror, and opened them again. He saw his reflection, pale and scared looking at first. But a moment later, the reflection smiled at him. It put its hands into its pocket and pulled out a blood-red stone. It winked and put the stone back in his pocket. And as it did so, Harry felt something heavy drop into his real pocket. Somehow, incredibly, he'd gotten the stone. Well, said Quirrell impatiently, what do you see? Harry screwed up his courage. I see myself shaking hands with Dumbledore, he invented. I, I've won the house cup for Gryffindor. Quirrell cursed again. Get out of the way, he said. As Harry moved aside, he felt the sorcerer's stone against his leg. Dare he make a break for it? But he hadn't walked five paces before a high voice spoke, though Quirrell wasn't moving his lips. He lies. He lies. Potter, come back here, Quirrell shouted. Tell me the truth. What did you just see? The high voice spoke again. Let me speak to him, face to face. Master, you are not strong enough. I have strength enough for this. Harry felt as if devil's snare was rooting him to the spot. He couldn't move a muscle. Petrified, he watched as Quirrell reached up and began to unwrap his turban. What was going on? The turban fell away. Quirrell's head looked strangely small without it. Then he turned slowly on the spot. Harry would have screamed, but he couldn't make a sound. Where there should have been a back to Quirrell's head, there was a face. The most terrible face Harry had ever seen. It was chalk white with glaring red eyes and slits for nostrils, like a snake. Harry Potter, it whispered. Harry tried to take a step back, but his legs wouldn't move. See what I have become, the face said. Mere shadow and vapor. I have form only when I can share another's body. But there have always been those willing to let me into their hearts and minds. Unicorn blood has strengthened me these past weeks. You saw Faithful Quirrell drinking it from me in the forest. And once I have the elixir of life, I will be able to create a body of my own. Now, why don't you give me that stone in your pocket? So he knew. The feeling suddenly surged back into Harry's legs. He stumbled backward. Don't be a fool, snarled the face. Better save your own life and join me, or you'll meet the same end as your parents. They died begging me for mercy. Liar, Harry shouted suddenly. Quirrell was walking backward at him so that Voldemort could still see him. The evil face was now smiling. How touching, it hissed. I always value bravery. Yes, boy, your parents were brave. I killed your father first, and he put up a courageous fight. But your mother needn't have died. She was trying to protect you. Now give me the stone, unless you want her to have died in vain. Never! Harry sprang toward the flame door, but Voldemort screamed, Seize him! And the next second, Harry felt Quirrell's hands close on his wrist. At once, a needle-sharp pain seared across Harry's scar. His head felt as though it was about to split in two. He yelled, struggling with all his might, and to his surprise, Quirrell let go of him. The pain in his head lessened. He looked around wildly to see where Quirrell had gone and saw him hunched in pain, looking at his fingers. They were blistering before his eyes. Seize him! Seize him! shrieked Voldemort again, and Quirrell lunged, knocking Harry clean off his feet, landing on top of him, both hands around Harry's neck. Harry's scar was almost blinding him with pain, yet he could see Quirrell howling in agony. Master, I cannot hold him. My hands, my hands. And Quirrell, though pinning Harry to the ground with his knees, let go of his neck and stared bewildered at his own palms. Harry could see they looked burned, raw, red, and shiny. Then kill him, fool, and be done, screeched Voldemort. Quirrell raised his hand to perform a deadly curse. But Harry, by instinct, reached up and grabbed Quirrell's face. Ah! Quirrell rolled off him, his face blistering too. And then Harry knew. Quirrell couldn't touch his bare skin, not without suffering terrible pain. His only chance was to keep hold of Quirrell, keep him enough pain to stop him from doing a curse. Harry jumped to his feet, caught Quirrell by the arm, and hung on as tight as he could. Quirrell screamed and tried to throw Harry off. The pain in Harry's head was building couldn't see. He could only hear Quirrell's terrible shrieks and Voldemort's yells of, kill him, kill him, and other voices 
baby in Harry's own head, crying, Harry, Harry. He felt Quirrell's arms wrench from his grasp, knew all was lost, and fell into blackness. Down, down, down. Something gold was glinting just above him. The snitch! He tried to catch it, but his arms were too heavy. He blinked. It wasn't the snitch at all. It was a pair of glasses. How strange. He blinked again. The smiling face of Albus Dumbledore swam into view above him. Good afternoon, Harry, said Dumbledore. Harry stared at him. Then he remembered. Sir, the stone! It was Quirrell! He's got the stone! Sir, quick! Calm yourself, dear boy. You are a little behind the time, said Dumbledore. Quirrell does not have the stone. Then who does? Sir, I... Harry, please relax, or Madame Pomfrey will have me thrown out. Harry swallowed and looked around him. He realized he must be in the hospital wing. He was lying in a bed with white linen sheets, and next to him was a table piled high with what looked like half the candy shop. Tokens from your friends and admirers, said Dumbledore, beaming. What happens down in the dungeons between you and Professor Quirrell is a complete secret, so naturally the whole school knows. I believe your friends Mr. Fred and George Weasley were responsible for trying to send you a toilet seat. No doubt they thought it would amuse you. Madame Pomfrey, however, felt it might not be very hygienic and confiscated it. How long have I been in here? Three days. Mr. Ronald Weasley and Miss Granger will be most relieved you have come around. They have been extremely worried. But, sir, the stone. I see you are not to be distracted. Very well, the stone. Professor Quirrell did not manage to take it from you. I arrived in time to prevent that. Although you were doing very well on your own, I must say. You got there? You got Hermione's owl? We must have crossed in midair. No sooner had I reached London than it became clear to me that the place I should be was the one I had just left. I arrived just in time to pull Coral off you. It was you. I feared I might be too late. You nearly were. I couldn't have kept him off the stone much longer. Not the stone, boy. You. The effort involved nearly killed you. For one terrible moment there, I was afraid it had. As for the stone, it has been destroyed. All right. We're going to stop there. You're so close to the end of the book. We have a little bit left. Um, I want to know your reactions to everything that just happened. Like, were you surprised when you found out Quirrell was the one who had been trying to get to the stone all along? What did you think of Voldemort? And what do you think is going to happen next? Why do you think they destroyed the stone? Let me know your thoughts.